an important detail we have not discussed yet is how exactly do the ions end up distributed the way they are, and most importantly, how is this distribution maintained across the membrane? As you will see throughout this video, the most important ions when it comes to signaling and conducting the action potential are potassium and sodium. For that reason, let's first cover what mechanisms the cell use to separate these two ions. The creation and the maintenance of the sodium and potassium gradient is performed by the sodium-potassium transporter, also known as the sodium-potassium pump. During a cycle of this protein, it exports three sodium ions for every two potassium ions it imports. From what we've mentioned about transporters, remember that moving ions against their concentration gradient requires energy. In this case, the energy to move potassium and sodium comes from the hydrolysis of ATP. You can notice that one consequence along with the creation of concentration gradients is the creation of a net positive charge on the extracellular side due to the extra positive charge exported in the sodium. Hence, it will be good to keep in mind that this protein also contributes to the membrane potential. Now, for the other ions, there are other transporters that are responsible for their gradients. In terms of the calcium gradient, there is a calcium pump that utilizes ATP hydrolysis to pump two calcium ions against their concentration gradient as well as importing two protons. Furthermore, calcium can be transported in the extracellular matrix through the sodium-calcium antiporter. Remember that to pump an ion against its electrochemical gradient, it requires energy. Antiporters are a class of ion transporters that generate sufficient energy by coupling the transport of another ion that goes down its electrochemical gradient. In this case, sodium, which we know is more concentrated outside, will have no problem flowing inside through the protein. In contrast to antiporters, which export and import ions, you can also find symporters, which either export or import ions in the same direction. For example, the potassium chloride symporter uses the movement of potassium to send chloride in the extracellular space. Here again, the protein uses the energy released by potassium flowing down its electrochemical gradient to fuel the process and extrude chloride. In summary, Ion transporters, regardless of how they get their energy, are very important proteins that allow the generation and the maintenance of electrochemical gradients. Now, back to the membrane, let's quickly summarize what we've established. Thanks to the ion transporters, each ion is now differently concentrated across the membrane. As a result, the ionic separation causes each ion to build an electrochemical gradient of its own that now greatly influences whether the ion wants to leave or enter the cell. Mathematically speaking, we were able to obtain a value of the equilibrium potential for each of our ions thanks to the Nernst equation. Now, remember previously that we have established the membrane potential, which was the difference in voltage between the extracellular matrix and the cytoplasm. Unfortunately for us, even though the equilibrium potential is a good indicator to know for each ion, it does not allow us to attribute a value to the membrane potential. This is mainly due to the fact that the Nernst equation does not take into account the ionic interactions that occur at the membrane. Now, what do I mean by these interactions and how will we be able to quantify them to get a value for the membrane potential? Recall in the second scenario, where I demonstrated the electrochemical gradient, that the membrane was only permeable to potassium. So, since potassium was the only ion that was able to move across the membrane, the membrane potential in this system was solely dependent on the equilibrium potential of potassium. Indeed, given that it is the only ion that can move to equilibrate the forces that it feels from the electric and chemical gradient, when the potassium will be at its equilibrium potential, then the membrane potential will also have no other choice but to be at the equilibrium value of potassium. In this scenario, however, if the chloride was able to move across the membrane, then its motion would have imposed its own electrochemical gradient on the membrane potential. In other words, the movement of chloride would have shuffled the ions in a different way and thus led to a different membrane potential. Another scenario we can think of is what would happen if the membrane was, yes, permeable to both ions, but considerably more permeable to potassium. In this case, the equilibrium potential of potassium would influence the resting membrane potential considerably more than chloride, 
simply because potassium ions can flow at a greater rate. So, back to my question, which was, what do I mean by the ionic interactions? As you can see from my explanation, the main factor of ionic interaction is the level of relative permeability each ion has with respect to the other ions. In other words, the ions that are able to flow the most will have the greatest influence on the value of the membrane potential. For that reason, to get an accurate value of the membrane potential, we need to turn to the Goldman equation, which factors the relative permeabilities of ions. The Goldman equation is very similar in shape to the Nernst equation, and it makes sense since we're still trying to figure out a voltage for our system. The first difference with the Nernst equation you will notice is the insertion of the permeability factor. The permeability factor, which has units of velocity, measures the rate of movement from the ion driven by a local concentration gradient. In other words, it is simply a measure from 0 to 1 on how great the ionic flux of the specific ion is. Another difference you will notice is the sum symbol, which simply indicates that this product of permeability times the concentration has to be present for each ion inside the logarithm. Now, back to our system, you can see in the right corner that I've written the long form of the Goldman equation and that I've simplified it in the same way we did with the Nernst equation by assuming a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius and changing the natural logarithm to a base 10 logarithm. You will notice that the concentrations for chloride are inverted. This is because the valence of chloride is negative 1, so with the properties of logarithms, we can invert the numerator and denominator to get rid of the negative. From experimental data, scientists have established that the permeability ratios for each ion at rest are the following. Potassium is valued at 1 because it is the reference the scientists took to arrive at the other values. You will notice that calcium is at 0, and that is just because it doesn't really affect the membrane potential at rest, so it is usually neglected from the Goldman equation. Since all the values we have for either the concentrations and the permeabilities are at rest, the membrane potential we get from the equation is what we refer to the resting membrane potential. And from our data, its value is minus 72 millivolts. As a quick note, regardless of if you use 5 or 15 for the intracellular sodium concentration, the resting membrane potential will only change by a few decimal because of sodium's very low permeability at rest, so we can essentially neglect the range of sodium. Now that we have the membrane potential, we can establish a new quantity known as the driving force. This quantity is obtained by taking the difference from the resting membrane potential and the equilibrium potential of the ion. The driving force is essentially a measure of how much the ion wants to move in or out of the membrane. As you can see, potassium at rest has a very low driving force compared to sodium since the membrane potential is predominantly set by the permeability of sodium. Keep the driving force in mind because this property will be very important for us in our future discussions. In summary, the resting membrane potential is governed by two factors. First, the considerably higher permeability of potassium relative to the other ions sets the resting membrane potential very closely to the equilibrium potential of potassium. Secondly, the sodium-potassium pump contributes a bit to the charge separation by pumping one extra positive charge in the extracellular matrix. As a result, it contributes to setting the resting membrane potential a few millivolts below. The most important function of the pump, however, is to maintain the concentration gradients for each ion. Without its constant action, the gradients would dissipate and the signaling mechanisms of the cell would all be damaged. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.